So here is um, a cover shot for my presentation. All of these motels were in the Bay Area. Uh, the upper uh, motel was the Tropicana in Mountain View. Uh, then we have the Glass Slipper in Palo Alto to the right. Um, I actually should try my pointer out here so you can see. It's a Glass Slipper. And then we have the Astro Motel in Antioch, a celebration of the Space Age. And then the Western Motel in Santa Clara. And the Glass Slipper, the Western, and the, and the uh, Astro are all still there. You can still see them today. Maybe not as shiny and bright. This is me learning to swim in a motel pool. I don't think I had learned to uh, swim by myself without the floaties at that point, but this is my Uncle Bill. And for us, again, a family vacation was a big deal. It was magical. And it meant I got to go swimming. We did not have a pool. Copy of my book, Motel California, which took about 10 years to do. And there are copies here at the library if you haven't seen it and you want to see it. Also be selling copies if anybody's interested. And we're going to start right in with vacancy, an introduction, a little overview of the history of the motel. So we're all on the same page. We're going to start with the definition of the motel. A roadside hotel designed primarily for motorists, typically having the rooms arranged in a low building with parking directly outside. Origin 1920s, blend of motor and hotel, also known as motor court, motor inn, motor hotel, motor lodge. This is a family photo I picked up at an estate sale. I don't know who these people are, but maybe someday I'll find out, and hopefully they will not mind that I used their picture in my book. <gasps> this is a family road trip uh, in California, 1963. This is the world's first motel, San Luis Obispo. And you will see this tower right here still stands. There have been some discussions of actually turning it into a boutique hotel property and building onto it. Um, this dates to 1925. You can see the historic plaque right here. It's on the side of the building that still stands. Um, and it was considered the world's first motel. Now, truth be told, there were other buildings of this type all over the country. Um, motels were built, uh, started out with uh, motor courts, uh, first free auto camps, auto sites for people that were traveling and had no place to stay. That evolved into uh, auto courts and motor courts and ultimately evolved into the motel. But this was the first time that the word motel was used. And as the legend goes, they tried to fit motor hotel onto the signage and they couldn't fit it, so they hyphenated Motor Hotel into Motel. Well, it caught on, and you'll see in early advertising literature, Motel. You'll see the hyphen. And this is the El Dorado Motel, and still, since the people may not know what a motel is, they say, that's a motor hotel. And um, that's in Stockton, it's still there from the 1930s. Um, Mission Revival style, a lot like the world's first motel, an ad, advocate, uh, matchbook cover advertisement, um, and how the actual property looks. It still looks much like that today, although I do believe the sign is gone. And you'll see what, some of the things that they're advertising here. Garage at your door. It's a property that's marketed to the automobile culture. Telephone. Not everybody had telephones then. Lobby, of course, that's a given. Steam heat. Air conditioning, that was a big one. There weren't a lot of motels built during the World War II. There was a, a cease to build. Um, and so we see this period where there are no motels built. And then following World War II, there's this economic boom. And in a few short decades, we're talking 1946 to 1961, we go from 20,000 motels in the United States to over 60,000 motels in the United States. Two states in particular were oversaturated with motels, California and Florida. Why? Because of the amount of business and also the amount of tourism. People were coming to these places um, on family road trips and on business. So here I, I, I find this really interesting. It's a guide for motel owners and, and how to set up your motel property. And you'll notice this is San Francisco, still there. 
think that's the Americana, if I'm right. And there's a match cover uh, that they were using to attract people into motel hotel management. And you'll notice here too, men, women, married couples. They were marketing to couples. What, what, what is interesting about this business model is it was an individually owned property at the time. And families tended to invest. Oftentimes families tended to live on site as well. Speaking of families, this is the family that owned the Polynesian Motel in Anaheim. I gave a presentation last year uh, in Anaheim, and one of the ladies in the audience just about fainted. She goes, that's my family's motel. And I said, show me. I want to see. And there, indeed, um, is her family in front of the sign. Um, and it meant a lot to her. Um, they had that for a number of decades. Um, and so I sent her my postcard so she could have her collection. But again, I want to just, you know, remind people that this was not uh, you know, a big uh, corporation with a, a number of different businesses. Um, this was, most of these businesses were privately held. Motel architecture, so the standard motel, early motels were to, tended to be built in, in U or L-shaped formations. They tended to be single story, but over time you start to see multi-story properties, especially in the 60s. Um, what most people don't think of when they think of a motel is, is that these were architect designed. And that's just not true. There had to be some sort of architect involved in some way. But in, in some cases, there were big name architects involved in motel design. This is the Holiday Lodge in San Francisco, 1955. People checking in. It was designed by Hertzka and Knowles. They also designed, they were the local architects for the Jack Tower Hotel off of Van Ness. The landscape architecture, they, had a land, they hired a landscape architect. Lawrence Halprin did the landscape design for this. Does that still exist? No, it does not. It was off of Van Ness. I can give you the, the address if you're dying to know. Most people are. 1901 Van Ness. But it was, it was really spectacular. I have the brochure with me. I wanted to share with people because it was really notable both inside and outside. The interior design was really spectacular as well. A lot of these properties, believe it or not, they hired interior designers for the rooms and for the lobbies. This is the Villa Roma. It's somewhat bittersweet looking at this motel property. One thing you'll notice is the unique round design. Um, and, you know, it wasn't an L shape. It wasn't, a, a, you know, a U shape. Um, it was multi-story and the parking was underneath. And does anybody know who designed the Villa Roma? No good, boy, you know you're Mari Campy. That's a close cigar, but that's not true. <laughs> Anshin and Allen, Eichler's first team of architects for Eichler Homes designed the Villa Roma. Herb Kane evidently didn't care for this much and called it the Rusty Donut. It is obviously gone, it, it came down and it was replaced by the Marriott Fisher's, Fisherman's Wharf, which is very forgettable, but that's just my opinion. And uh, because it, it took up too much space, they could build up. Right? You can cram more rooms on the property. But really, a, spect a spectacular example of modern uh, architecture. And you'll look at the interiors. If you can see close up, this looks like it might be a Saarinen table or a Saarinen knockoff. I mean, they had beautiful interiors. And you'll also see this incredible mosaic right by the office. That still exists. It was saved, and it's up in Sausalito in a park. Highly recommend you go visit that mosaic. It's just a beautiful piece of artwork. So at least that got saved. Anshin and Allen, Villa Roma. Travelodge at the wharf. Travelodge was a chain out of Southern California. However, this particular Travelodge was architect designed. Any guesses on this Travelodge? You'll also notice that the parking is underneath, right? San Francisco parking, notoriously awful. And you'll also notice that the pool is above the parking, which I am always just fascinated by. How do they do that? You know, water's pretty heavy. And they did that at the Jack Tar too. The Jack Tar Hotel had a four floor patio in the sky with a pool and an ice skating rink. This is John Savage Bowles, the architect for Candlestick Park. And it still exists. It's a boutique hotel now. For me, the motel was about fantasy. 
Um, and so there was a lot of creativity that went into uh, post-war uh, motel architecture. Most often, it was the signage that the creativity went into um, and the theming. Um, when you think about it and you think of the number of motels that existed, if you just go down Lombard Street in San Francisco, the number of motels that still exist, they all have to compete against one another for the business. So if you have you know, a basic motel property, how do you differentiate your from the 10, 15 other motels that are all within walking distance. You have to think about how you're going to make yours stand out, especially from the road, because at this time, the sign was a big part of the marketing strategy for the, the property, the business property. That's how you got people to come off the road and come and, and spend money at your property. This is an architectural rendering from Signs of the Times magazine of a motel that was never built, a sign that was no, not built, but I thought it was real interesting. People were putting a lot of time uh, into the actual sign design. These are all designed by, by designers, I mean, professional designers. So I like to go into the themes, because theming is one of the, the, the main ways that these motels differentiated themselves from one another. And Storyland was one of the big themes, why? Because these motels were built for family trips and business trips, but also for children. Glass slipper in again. The facade is still there. You'll know that if you look at uh, a narrow view of this property, it is a classic U-shaped motel. This is off of El Camino Real in Palo Alto. And what they did as a gimmick to get kids to, to scream from behind, uh, you know, the, seat, the parents' seats in the, in the uh, station wagon, uh, to pull over is they created this faux facade of a, a fairy tale castle, and it's still there. I think it would be in Disneyland, but it's not. It's in Palo Alto. Peter Pan Motor Lodge. I had to throw in a motel from the Anaheim area because there were so many storybook motels, um, all advertising to the pint-sized consumer, right? The, 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 the kids that were going to get the parents to pull over. This Peter Pan Motel opened up in 1956, one year after Disneyland opened. Um, probably uh, got inspiration from the Peter Pan ride at Disneyland. Um, and after a while um, of all these motels being built, Walt Disney got very upset. He was not happy with the theming. Um, he fought, uh, for example, the Candy Cane Motel was supposed to be the Cinderella Motel, and he fought against the naming of that um, because he wanted to kind of control the fantasy and the excitement to within the park gates. Um, so he was not a fan of all the motels around Disneyland. Um, this, this motel property was pretty substantial and it kind of was a model for other motels to follow. And look at this, the sign is just, it's huge, it's neon. And then there are all these additional signs that are add-ons. I was gonna bring one of my uh, carte blanche signs today, but it couldn't fit in the car. Uh, they were all add-ons. So if, if, if there was a, an affiliation with uh, diners Club or AAA approved, then those businesses would slap on a sign to the main sign. Um, and if you were a AAA member, you would be able to see that in your AAA guide. I'm going to push through here because we have a, a lot of uh, themes to go through. The Western Frontier. Um, in California, the Western theme motel was extremely popular for a number of reasons. One, all the Westerns that were filmed here in Southern California, but also the gold rush um, and the history here. Um, and so you'll see a lot of Western themed motels. The Pony Express was in West Sacramento. No longer there. And this is a postcard view and you can see that they're advertising the pool and their sign. And then of course, the girl in the front in the bathing suit quite attractive. The Western Motel in Santa Clara, at the time this was built in 1948, there was nothing around El Camino Real, nothing. Santa Clara was orchards, and they were anticipating the growth. And within 10 years, they had added an, an additional wing to the motel property, and then added this huge neon sign, which still exists, although the neon has been stripped. Moving into Desert Oasis, California has three deserts, which lent itself nicely to desert-themed motels, and also the American fascination with the Middle East, 
in the post-World War II era. This is the Algiers in Redwood City, and they had one heck of an amazing sign, probably not politically correct um, by today's standards. Um, and it was a very large property. You'll see it's, it's a U-shaped formation. Um, and the pool strategically placed right within street view and the sign within street view. The property still exists. It's not a, it's just a kind of a standard motel. They've covered in the pool and you wouldn't even recognize it if, if you drove by. That's what it used to look like. The sign is long gone. They chose the themes, right? All these themes were mom and pop, you know, or, or family members deciding how they were going to market their business. So they were pulling the themes from American popular culture, whether it be a movie or you'll, you'll see this huge uh, number of motels with the name Sands and Stardust built after the Sands and Stardust opened up in Las Vegas. So like, hey, let's call our motel the Stardust. And evidently you could do that. But yeah, I'm sure that they were inspired by movies, they were inspired by television, they were inspired by the space race, um, they were inspired that for, for children, um, you know, advertisers were aggressively marketing to children um, because they had tremendous buying power. They may not have had wallets, but they had a lot of buying power. This is fantastic. This is another uh, motel in Anaheim. Um, it was the Pyramid Motel, and again, you're looking for a gimmick to get people to pull over. And their gimmick was ride our camel, um, pull over and have a photo op with our camel. And I don't know, again, I, I don't think that uh, you would encourage people to do that today because you'd be afraid of a lawsuit. But at that time, people would pull over and take a picture on the camel. I don't know if they would stay there. Would, I would hope a few of them chose to stay. There were two other camels in the United States at this time. One was at the uh, Sahara Hotel in Las Vegas, and one was at the Sahara, um, also a hotel, motor hotel in, in Florida and in Miami. So this was a, not a, a one of a kind gimmick. However, the one in Anaheim did have a ladder, which was convenient. The others, I don't know how people got on. Tropical Paradise. This is a, a really interesting chapter in the book because ironically, there were more Polynesian-themed motels in California than any other place in the United States, including Hawaii. Why would that be? Any ideas? All the soldiers shipping out and coming and going. This was the main port to the Pacific Theater during World War II. So you'll see also San Francisco Bay Area, and San Francisco in particular, a lot of tiki theme bars, Polynesian themed bars, the um, most notable probably the Tonga Room in San Francisco, um, Trader Sam's on Geary. Our family had a tiki bar on Geary called the Trade Winds. Um, of course, there was Trader Vic's in Oakland, founded in Oakland off San Pablo Avenue. It's still Trader Vic's in Emeryville, which you haven't been, you need to go. But anyway, Polynesian theme, very, very popular theme in California. Um, one, because of the historic connection uh, to the Polynesian Islands, and also because the weather was really conducive to some of these tropical-themed motels. The Tiki Inn in Palo Alto, it actually had a giant tiki out front. And that's the whole front of it. You can see these zigzag roof lines, so it's kind of like the Flintstones meet Polynesian culture. In a way, you've got the, the, the bamboo. Um, and this is 1963. The motel actually still stands, but it's been completely stripped of anything that would indicate that it used to be a tiki-themed or a Polynesian-themed motel. But it was, it was really notable. Right near Stanford, too. Tropicana. So this is actually on the cover of my book, and this is notable in the sense that uh, it was designed by architects Arme and Davis, and they're best known as coffee shop architects. Um, architects of the original Denny's with the boomerang roof line, the original Bob's Big Boy, um, a number of coffee shops in Southern California. They're best known for their coffee shop architecture, but most people don't know that they also built at least 20, 25 motels, oftentimes in conjunction with one of their googie style restaurants or their space age architecture, roadside architecture uh, type restaurants, but not always. Um, and Tropicana in Fresno was built in 1961. 
Um, the motel portion still exists. It's a budget motel. The restaurant, unfortunately, was demolished years ago. Um, but you can still find, this is where my curiosity gets the best of me, if you walk around the property, there are still tiki's. Uh, the overgrown landscaping, if you put, pull the landscaping back, you will see these masks. They're still there on the side of the building. The entrance is still there. And by the pool, there are two tiki gods guarding where the diving board used to be. So it's just real interesting. It's a little, do a little architectural trespass next time you're in Fresno. Cosmic Voyage, my favorite chapter. <laughs> the American fascination with the space race. It's the Astro Motel in Pasadena. Chain was founded in, in Southern California, based in Glendale. This uh, motel property is built in 1962. Still there. Here's the second iteration, uh, the, the first prototype you saw prior that was a one of a kind. They hired an architect to do a prototype for the chain. And so this is the second prototype and most of the motels were built using this design. Their tagline, space age luxury at down to earth rates. And there's the little spaceman with his suitcase, probably gearing uh, a lot of their advertising to business travelers. Very 60s, the architecture. This is my favorite chain, or was my favorite chain. This is where we had to stay when we went to Disneyland. This is a Stovall's property. Al Stovall was, I think, a genius. My dad would disagree. Um, anyway, he designed and built a number of space age themed motels in Anaheim around Disneyland, probably borrowing a lot of the theming from Tomorrowland. And the first in his chain was the Space Age Lodge built in, and opened in 1964. And if you look at this, this is a port cochere, so your car pulls right in here. You've got a rocket. You've got a bunch of, I don't know, meteors, satellites. This is a satellite, I think. Uh, you've got little space guy. Um, this, I'm not quite sure what that is. And then I don't know the connection between the topiary garden um, and this, but you know, there's a lot of creativity going in here. And when you're a kid, I mean, it was like a visual explosion. Wait till we see the lobby, it'll fall over. So it, this was so popular, they built four more after the Space Age Lodge opened. And there's actually one also in, in Arizona, in Gila Bend. There he is, he's happy because he's making a lot of money, buying a lot of leisure suits. These are the actual doorknobs. Some of them still exist. I'm trying to get my hands on one. You'll see this loose site. Look like those grapes you used to get in the 60s, right? So Stovall owned a plastics factory, which was really convenient. He had all this stuff built for his motel properties. Here's a little spaceman. Um, and this still exists. The motel has since received a Mediterranean makeover. But if you look closely, you can find little, little hints as to what it used to look like. And they still have these windows. Look at that lobby. <laughs> A new achievement in motor hotel design, I'll say. <laughs> now, no, that's not to everybody's taste. That certainly wasn't to my father's taste. He thought it was pretty hideous. But for a kid, that was magic. Talk about going to another world. I mean, unlike anything you'd ever seen. And, and as uh, the years progressed, they started to hang big animals from the ceiling too. And then they had like, you know, some of the earliest computer games were in the lobby as well. So it was really incredible. And it's interesting because this motel lobby still exists, but there's, you know, very little to indicate what it used to look like. And my dad and I actually stayed there last November. I was in Anaheim for a presentation. And I showed the, the people working at the front desk. I said, you know, hey, take a look at this. They're like, wow, that's incredible. I'm like, yeah, that's your lobby. And they couldn't believe it. But a lot of magic here, a lot of fantasy. OK, I got to talk about Seaside Escape because so much of the tourism in California were people coming to visit the ocean resorts um, and the boardwalks. Um, we had here Playland at the beach. And we had the boardwalk in Long Beach, Santa Monica, um, Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk, of course. And so Seaside and Sea Escape Seaside escape and um, ocean themes were really common in California. This one's kind of interesting. It's the Seashell Motel in Blythe. Has anyone been in Blythe? 
Is any seashells in Blythe? Not many. Blythe is in the middle of the desert. So here's where fantasy comes in. Blythe is in the middle of the desert, um, and you know they were uh, marketing a sanctuary, a seaside sanctuary in the middle of the desert um, with a poolside slide, and they also offered free donuts and coffee. And again, you see all the parking right in front of the rooms. Very convenient, very casual, not stuffy like a hotel. The Sea Captain's Motel in San Francisco. The building is still there. You would never know. But it is on Lombard. If you want to know the address, I will pull it up because someone always asks. Lombard is a lot of fun. That would be a good tour, a motel tour on Lombard. You know, I don't have the address here, but I can get it to you. 1954. And this is Ch Charles Jokestad. He actually is a sea captain, and he owned the Sea Captain's Motel. Mountain High, one of my favorites. Two resort areas in California, one in Northern California, kind of built around the Tahoe area, and then another in Southern California, built around the San Bernardino area. Ravenwood Motel. This is really interesting. Most of the motels in the Tahoe area were built after 1960. Anybody have an idea why there were so many motels built in Tahoe after 1960? Winter, Olympic, Winter Olympics. So people would go to Tahoe to camp and to boat and to relax on the beach. And it was always marketed as a place to go for recreation. But after the 1960 Winter Olympics, it really was heavily marketed as a place to go for vacation. Um, and they built tons and tons of roadside motels. Many of them still stand. The Ravenswood is still there. The Alpine Motel, this is another interesting property. This is actually still standing. It's near Anaheim, right near Disneyland. Um, and it kind of borrowed the theming from the Matterhorn. Um, and the fun thing about this is you can see the beginning. When it was first built in the late 50s, it has the kind of tar and gravel uh, roof line. And in order to kick up the theming, they actually added the faux snow and more of a chalet look later on. The sign, unfortunately, is gone, and we'll get to, get, get to that in a minute. Let's eat. One of the most important things for a motel in the early 1960s was that there would be either a, re a restaurant on the site, on the premises, or there would be a restaurant within walking distance. That was very important to travelers. So you will start to see some pretty remarkable Restaurants. This is the world of pancakes at the Los, Ant Los Altos Inn Motel, a sign that you cannot miss from the street. They had every possible pancake you could think of. Pancakes were very popular then. That has been demolished in recent years. This is the restaurant at the Tropics in Palm Springs, Ken Kimes property. The restaurant was managed by Sambos. They're dipping their toes into uh, managing a restaurant as well as a cocktail lounge. They were best known for their coffee shops. Um, and the fun thing about this is not only that the decor is just mind blowing, but it's kind of to me, it's funny that they would name their steakhouse the Congo when the theme was Polynesian, the tropics. So, you know, you're really thinking outside the box here and getting real creative. And I guess after a few cocktails, who cares? So there's a little discrepancy, right? The building is still there. This wonderful restaurant is not. Mermaid rooms were really popular at the time. In fact, there was a mermaid room at the, is it the Mission? Bimbo. There's, yeah, there's one mermaid. I, I've never seen her at Bimbo's. I would like to see her. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of the motel in Milbray, um, El Rancho. El Rancho Milbray had a mermaid room. Um, and. This is actually the mermaid room at the Hacienda in Fresno, where you would go and you'd have your cocktail and you would look at synchronized swimmers. Um, there's also another one at the Stardust in San Diego. A lot of fun. The rooms. People tell me that in the book, the rooms, are, that's one of their favorite chapters, and I find that really interesting. But most people don't think about motel rooms. Most of these rooms were really staged, and they would bring in a lot of 
uh, advertisers and products that they could actually market. So you you would see little signs for this is a beauty rest mattress that you're laying on, and this room was designed by such and such, and they're based in San Francisco or Los Angeles if you want to hire them for the interior design. And everything down to the shampoo and the, and the, the soap. Um, for people that were traveling, it was a way to be introduced to a new product, a new type of soup, a new shampoo. Um, and everybody pocketed those freebies and took them with them. And if they liked them, they would hopefully buy the, the large size at their local drugstore. I just love some of these old rooms. This is a Stardust in, in Anaheim. All the design down to the lamps. And because these were individually owned properties, the, there was a lot of creativity that went into the design both exterior and interior. You see the orange trees? Anaheim used to have orange trees everywhere. In fact, there were orange trees before there was Disneyland. Here's, a, again, my favorite motel chain. And this is one of the Stovall's properties. And this is great. Look at a new concept in spacious comfort. The space bubble dividers. New styrene lighting, daring new interior colors. They were daring, along with beautiful appointments and an exciting, newer than tomorrow space age decor. They took theming to the next level. They really did. This is a, another a part of the book that people seem really interested in, and it, it's the concept and the fat of the vibrating bed. This is another gimmick. Um, and most people are familiar with the Magic Fingers vibrating beds, and I ended up bringing a Magic Fingers device so you could see this is what would go underneath and attach to the box spring underneath your mattress and make the bed vibrate after you put a quarter in. Um, but prior to Magic Fingers, there was Pulsar Rhythm. And Pulsar Rhythm uh, was a, started in, in Saint, I want to say St. Petersburg, Florida, in Florida, late 50s. And they actually built the device into the actual rods of the mattress. And they promised a cure for everything. Uh, bursitis, arthritis, heart ailments. I mean, you name it. They pro and then the FDA came along and said, uh, 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 and slapped them with major fines, made them throw out the mattresses, and basically, basically put them out of business. And the next person that came in, I have a feeling he was a salesman for Pulse Rhythm. But he came in and, and devised the, the uh, magic fingers bed where you actually have the device separate from the bed. Um, and that just took off, made him a multimillionaire. But this is really fun. Look at the TV antennas with, with the uh, aluminum foil. Real classy, right? Mom and pop. Yeah, ask us about our pulse rhythm beds. The pools. This is another favorite chapter of mine because for me, the pool was magic. And most people that I knew didn't have a pool. You'd go down to the public pool if you wanted to go swimming or if you, maybe you had one friend or two friends that had an apartment with a pool or you're always looking for a way to get to a pool when you're a kid. Um, and so now we see motels in the 60s have to have a pool to be competitive. You have to have food that's relatively accessible and you also have to have a pool. Here is the Motel Lodge in San Jose, which still stands with pool, 1962. This is great. This is uh, the Sundial Lodge in Modesto. It actually had a sundial that worked. I don't know, this looks very dangerous to me. It's no, no longer there. They actually uh, tore that down and, and it's in landfill on the property. And here's another space age motel pool, one of the Stovall's properties. They claimed that this was, this was designed in the shape of a space capsule. And then you have the changing rooms in a geodesic dome. And you've got your slide, and all the theming. The signs, extremely important when it comes to roadside advertising. These are some of the signs that were around Disneyland in the 50s. They're all gone. So in the 1990s, the city of Anaheim decided to beautify the area and make it more of a resort uh, environment. And what they did was they tore down whatever signs were left. Now, it's real interesting to think about the motels around Disneyland in the 50s and 60s because there were over 50. There were over 50 just 
in the square of the perimeter of the park. And most have since been demolished. Of the few that still remain, their signs have been taken away. But a lot of uh, incredible design here and history lost. Caravan Motel in Santa Maria. This is really interesting. I never noticed this until we blew up the card that not only does it have a camel, it has a diving lady. Does anybody know what the diving lady signifies? There's a pool on the property. And you'll see signs uh, uh, on motels that didn't have pools adding diving neon diving ladies to their signs as they build their pools. So maybe the, the motel property opens in 1958 like the, the uh, City Center Motel in San Jose, it opened in the late 50s. They didn't have a pool. They added the diving lady sign after they built the pool. I love it too, there's a phone booth right here. There's a phone booth on the National Register. This is the Flamingo in Santa Rosa, said to be inspired by the Flamingo Hotel in Las Vegas. Still there for many, many years, their spinning flamingo, their neon flamingo was in storage covered in bird poop and somebody had the bright idea to take it out and restore it, and now it spins again. Islander in, in Santa Cruz, still there, 1963. It's a great plastic sign. The rooms were themed, exotic. There's kind of these interesting handmade kind of, I don't know what you would call these chairs, but they're, really, they're still there, real interesting. Wood, handmade wood chairs. The Stardust Lodge in Lake Tahoe is another one of my favorite signs. I, I stress the signs because so few of them still exist. Um, in the mid 60s, there were a lot of highway beautification and urban beautification initiatives that really took down the majority of roadside signs. Um, and so if you see a sign like this, it is a true survivor. Um, not only did the property owner, were they willing to keep it well maintained, which costs a lot of money, but also it somehow escaped all these sign ordinances. No vacancy, what happened to the motel? When I was researching motels, I was shocked to, to find out, and I never really thought about it, but really they stopped building motels in the 60s. So the motel in, in the United States peaked in the early 1960s with over 60,000 60, units, or 60,000 motel properties, but within a decade they'd lost about 10,000. So we'll talk a little bit about what happened to the motel. It's an old sign in Merced, still there. First, the highways. The highways, they bypassed a lot of the traffic away from the smaller routes. So if you ever take a drive down from San Francisco to the South Bay, a great example is what happened to the Bayshore Highway. You'll see a bunch of old motels along the Bayshore Highway. When they built 101, they put up all these walls. You can't even see the motels on Bayshore anymore. Um, and so these mom and pops are really relying upon roadside traffic to get, to pull in the consumers off the road, that traffic was being pushed elsewhere. They weren't getting that traffic anymore. So that was the first thing that happened. Also, the, the, in California, as I mentioned before, there was market oversaturated, uh, oversaturation. Um, and then came the chains. Starting as early in the 1950s, Travelodge was around. Travelodge actually dates back to the 1940s, but then there was a stop on building because of the war. And then they started up in the 50s again. But these three chains on the top, they're all based in California. Travelodge, San Diego, Motel 6, Santa Barbara, and Vagabond with Southern California and El Segundo. Um, they each had their own little logo and their mascot. Do you know why the Motel 6 was called the Motel 6? Six bucks for the room. I think it might have been six dollars and sixty cents for a single. Now these three chains, they were elsewhere. You had Ramada Inn out of Phoenix. You had Howard Johnson's out of Boston and Holiday Inn out of Memphis. And they came into California too. So these individual property owners have to compete not only against the chains offering standardized services, but also these other players are coming from outside the state. And you're seeing, especially in recent years, we're seeing a lot of motel properties demolished as there's this movement to high density mixed use development. Um, I have been speaking with people in Reno. They are beside themselves. They've lost 11 motel properties since August of last year. There are three more that are going to be demolished soon. They're trying to find a way to save the signs. 
But when you think about Reno and all the people that went to Reno for gambling and also to get married and to get divorced, um, the motel, there are a lot of motels there and they're having a lot of trouble saving any of them at this point. This actually is in Santa Cruz and we shot this about two years ago um, as it was coming down and they're demolishing all three motels on the block for a larger development. We tried to save the sign, but it crumbled. That happens a lot with plastic signs. You try to pull them apart and then they just fall apart. But there's also a little bit of hope. And here's a story of hope. This is the caravan, Caravan Lodge, San Francisco. It's now the Phoenix. It's the first joie de vie boutique hotel. And it was a success story. It was such a success that joie de vie started placing their brand on other roadside motels and fixing them up and turning them into boutique hotels, like the Laurel Motor Inn. That's another joie de vie property, also the Kabuki is joie de vie. And you're also seeing other motels around the state being fixed up and turned into boutique hotels. This is the Astro Motel using the second building prototype. This is up in Santa Rosa. This is what it used to look like. Here's the rendering for what's to come. And they just opened it last year. And it's an absolutely beautiful property. They use uh, lo work of local artisans in the room as well as vintage mid-century furniture. And after the fires up in uh, Northern California, they offered uh, free rooms to the people that were displaced by the fires. So there is a little bit of hope. Any questions, comments, complaints? Family owned and operated. I'm thinking about the movies, maybe 